You don't need. You don't even need to order. No, I walk in and they hand me the drink and and the bill. So so far, I've spent uh, forty five million dollars on coffee. <laughs> I'm not even exaggerating. <laughs> We're here at um, what's the name of this place? Uh, it's called Starbucks. Yeah. It's a new it's a new coffee chain that actually just launched uh, about a month ago. <laughs> Most people don't know about them. The Green Umbrella. <laughs> there you go. Okay. C'è qualcuno là fuori? Benvenuti al Christian Podcast. Yes, my friends, survivors, right after the apocalypse, my name is Beto Gudinho. A special episode from Las Vegas, Nevada. Welcome to Christian Podcast, where we have God thinkers every week. And we go from blasphemous to divine through emoji reactions. <laughs> So that intro, you've been listening to Pastor Mike Decker and Patrick Detkin, and we're gonna, I'm going to introduce them to you. I just started recording, and I'm like, okay, let's just start the episode right there as he was talking about his new coffee chain <laughs> that he released. But today's topic, we're in Las Vegas. We're, no, I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing here, but I thought should be fun that as people call Vegas, you know, they, they have this, this motto, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So what better than asking a person who lives in Vegas, the sins of Sin City. So Patrick, how are you doing this morning? And Pastor Mike Decker, let's go around the table and introduce ourselves. I already say I'm Beto Gudinho, but Patrick, would you say who you are and a little bit what you do? Yes, well, it is an uh, honor to be with you guys uh, this afternoon, and it is a, um, a blissful 60 degrees right now in Las Vegas, Nevada. It will turn into 120 degrees in probably about a week. So I've been here in Las Vegas for a little over eight years. Uh, again, my name is Patrick Detkin. I'm a pastor in uh, the city here in Las Vegas at a church called Hope Church, and uh, been in ministry. Uh, this is my 23rd year. I'm actually born and bred in Orange County. Uh, I knew uh, Pastor Mike back there when I was uh, part of a church called The Crossing in Costa Mesa. And uh, we've loved now, it they, here. Did they kick you out or did you leave on your own accord? Well, listen, that, that, those are stories that we <laughs> just don't need to talk about right now because, you know, we don't have time for that. But, you know, <laughs> no, Pastor Tim Selleck is a senior pastor and uh, that's, uh, that is the church that God used uh, to bring me into full-time ministry. So uh, that church is a very special place in my heart. For sure. Love it. Mike. Tell us about who you are. And, well, I'm going to say this because I want to tease an episode that's coming up someday, right? But it's going to be titled, I Hire an Illegal Immigrant. But we'll leave that for another day. <laughs> that <laughs> sounds exciting. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a um, pastor in Costa Mesa, California, which is Orange County. We uh, Newport Beach and Huntington Beach borders our city, for those of you who are into the geography. I'm a dad of two daughters and one son-in-law, <clears throat> been in pastoral ministry in Costa Mesa for 33 years, mm -hmm. and for the last 23 years, I've been privileged to uh, lead a group of people who call Palm Harvest Church their home. And Beto and I are a part of the same ministry team. Uh, he's an all-star, as a, though you, those of you who are tuning in know already, so it's been really fun to, to be uh, exploring ministry together. Awesome. There you go. Okay. So the sins of Sin City, because why not, right? We're in, um, we're in a town that's known for, well, I don't know if it's known for this, but I guess a lot of people would know it as like debauchery place where, you no, know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. That could be already like a blasphemous idea right there because I have emojis. I'll, I'll tell you all about it, Patrick, but um, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So Patrick, 
as you've been living here and witnessing, you no, know, doing ministry, you come from from Orange County doing ministry for so many years already. Did that phrase strike you as a reality now that you live here? What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What have you witnessed in terms of sin in Vegas? <laughs> yeah. That's different than other cities. <laughs> well, here's I think Vegas gets kind of a, a strange rap because most people, their impression of Las Vegas is the strip. And so they come with an intent. I mean, it, it, Vegas, it, it really is the Sodom and Gomorrah of the United States. So it, it's the place where the, the economy is built on this desire where you can actually get all of your desires met. Mm. And so that has been uh, the economy of Las Vegas, but primarily from the strip. And so you have people that that's their, that's their snapshot of what the city is. But to be honest with you, uh, that's just one little area. Um, it really is a family dynamic. Um, there are incredible amounts of families here. Um, where I live in Henderson, uh, Caddy Corner with Summerlin. So yes, you have Las Vegas, you have the kind of the mantras, whatever happens in Vegas stays in Las Vegas. But in a lot of ways, it's also a family town. So you have those that come in, they spend money, they do things that they would never do anywhere else and feel the freedom to do that. And then they go back home. But those that live in Las Vegas, um, it's really not how we think. And it has probably more of a small town feel than most people even know. Wow. Mike, so you invited me to this trip to Las Vegas because we you know I work at Palm Harvest. I'm I do many things there, uh, and you're the lead pastor. You had known Patrick for a few years now, and so, anyways, we're here, Mike. What? Uh, and you already have a connection with Patrick before, so I almost feel like, can you? What kind of questions as a pastor do you have for Patrick that you think could be helpful for people doing ministry uh, that are listening? Well, you know, I, 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 right, right now what's going through my mind is last night after we uh, were doing some filming, we, we did some, just drove around, and one of the things I noticed is there's just a lot of redevelopment taking place. There's new apartments going up. As you get down, uh, I don't know what direction is that, west? As you go west, you right. know, into a lot of the, just so many buildings are vacant that I kept telling the guys, gosh, this is really a, a place where you could plant churches, right? This is the place where you could create new new conversations with people and and um, so I, I think from a, from a, what have you learned, Michael? So you have gone from uh, Orange County to, to now this, let's just use your word, the neighborhood church. Is there a big difference? Have you noticed any differences between uh, Costa Mesa? Or have you just realized that people are people and everybody sort of has the same needs? Yeah, I, I, exactly what you said. And then I th people are people. At the end of the day, the same tensions that people carry here in Las Vegas are the same tensions that they're carrying in Orange County. So we've seen a boom economically. Um, what's been fascinating is it, even in the real estate world is how much, when people used to come to Vegas, it really was affordable. But what we're saying is we're seeing a transition from a lot of people from Southern California transitioning here to Las Vegas. And so we're just seeing the economy just take off. We're seeing the housing development. You're, you saw that, Mike, the amount of homes that are being built out because of so many people uh, that are coming here to Las Vegas because it is affordable, more so than it is in some of the surrounding states. But in terms of the issues at hand, we're dealing with the same realities. We're dealing with homelessness. We're dealing with drug addiction. We're dealing with uh, the, the issues of sexual temptation. We, we see the percentages increase primarily because of just the reality of just how accessible it is. You know, when Orange County, there's places that you would go to that were somewhat hidden. People knew about them, yeah. but it'd take a little bit of work to get there. Here, uh, people know exactly where they're at and, and they're somewhat celebrated because it's a party atmosphere. So it's a, it's, it's probably a little bit of a different acceptance when it comes to sin. 
um, because the amount of people that, that come, they come because they want to experience things and do things that they would typically do in their own city in a hidden way. <laughs> Here it's somewhat done uh, outside and it's more exposed and it's probably a little bit more celebrated so they feel more the freedom to live in that place of sin uh, than they would in maybe their, their, their city that they're coming from. So I moved from the Midwest to California. When I was in the Midwest, I had people tell me, you're going to really do well in California because you have a bit of a progressive mindset. Like, I'm still very, very much conservative. Have you found personally, so now you've been, so you've, you're born and raised by your own testimony earlier in, in, you know, Orange County. Have you found that even in your own thinking, in your spiritual maybe worldview, has it become more progressive even being in a, a city where, uh, I, I don't want to go to s as far as say that sin is encouraged, but it you're in an environment where it's maybe embraced. Um, have you found your what's happened in your own spiritual uh, development? Uh, has that sort of that culture? Have you is that pushing up against you? Do you find yourself fighting against that? Yeah, I mean it's it's interesting. I, I when I, when we came out here, my kids were littler and one of the biggest questions that I had was how would this affect my my kids you know what what kind of influence now being here now my son's in a freshman in college and my daughter's a, a, a junior but when we got here they were in grade school and junior high and and so my fear was how much uh, how much influence would the the culture have uh, on their own spiritual journey as well as just even us and I think that what I've discovered is this environment has actually drawn us closer into a dependence on God because it's so pervasive. Mm. We have to be clear on who we are and who our God is. And we've got to be very clear on what we believe because within this culture, everything is accessible and everything is permissible. And so I think the more you're around a culture that allows certain temperaments, certain certain expectations, certain uh, benefits uh, that are more driven by the flesh, the more that becomes um, acceptable, the more you've got to be defined by what you believe are the non-negotiables. And I think for us, as, even as a family, that has solidified itself probably more so in Las Vegas than it did in Orange County. And so I'm not sure that our faith was, our faith was tested uh, in the same way that it's been tested here. And because it's been tested in this environment, I think my ki watching my kids grow in Christ and even just our own spiritual journey is probably more solidified than it ever has been. Wow. So it took going to Sin City to solidify faith. But what a calling, man. I, I can't help but think of Abraham and Lot, right, and the choices that they had to make. And even Abraham almost like saying to Lot, hey, you choose, and I'll go the opposite way. But you mentioned Sodom and Gomorrah, and that's exactly where Lot was heading, right? Uh, but at the same time, then Abraham is, in, is interceding for Lot on his behalf. So, but anyways, when you said uh, you used the word, you were saying, oh, what was the word? Uh, tested our faith. No, you said something else. The non-negotiables. That just struck me. Like, what what did you find learning about you know, your your family's journey, your faith? That now you can call, man. These are our non-negotiables. Yeah, the biggest thing. There's there's a verbiage that we use at our church, um, and it's just two words. It's God dependence, and the 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 value of God dependence is the reminder daily that apart from Him, we can do nothing. Nothing, not some things, not a few things, not a handful of things, but nothing. And so leaning into that God dependence is this picture that we cannot take a day off from our faith. We, we don't have that luxury. And so if this is a battle, and it is, and if we're living in Las Vegas and temptation is just around the corner, and it is, we've got to be willing to suit up every day. And we've got to be attentive. We've got to be alert. All those things that passages like Ephesians 6 talks about. We've got to stand firm. So it is, it's done an incredible work in our faith. 
But at the same time, the the God dependence has been a non-negotiable because we've seen we we've seen people that have chosen to take days off of their faith and how they 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 make decisions uh, that they would have never imagined that they were going to make and they do and we've seen people fall quickly because the temptation uh, is just so so clear and so available to people so that god dependence has been a big deal wow amazing thanks for sharing mike what what are you thinking of well, right now head, this is where my head is going i think I think there's invitations for us to step in to our neighborhood or our world every single day. We don't have to live in Costa Mesa. We don't have to live in Las Vegas. As you were talking, I was thinking you, Patrick, you're the, you're the perfect guy to, for this community. Like you're a warrior. Like when I think of the word warrior, you're athletic, you know, you're, you're fit, uh, you're good, good looking, you know, all good looking, yeah. sexy voice, you know, all those things, but you know, Thank you. but, the, but from there I was thinking, you know, but for people listening, we all have an opportunity. It may not be, it may not be Vegas. It may not be Costa Mesa. It could be Bismarck, North Dakota. It could be you know some small town in Iowa. And I think the invitation is, I need to be just as proactive in those communities as you are here. I can't let my guard down anymore. There's opportunity for me to step into the people's messes there just as much a, a, as it is here. I'm not. Sh I guess what I'm saying is I don't think the temptation is even that much greater here than in other places. And so, consequently, uh, what I'm saying is to those of you listening, God needs your voice where you're at. That's right. Right. So wherever right. God has placed you, be that person that with will with real proactivity That's and right. intentionality step into your world. Because there are people who need you right yeah. where, uh, right where you're at. Yeah, without a doubt. I, I've always been a I've been a big believer that, uh, and you kind of alluded to this, Mike, is that wherever God places you, He purposes you. In other words, whatever environment, whatever neighborhood, whatever city, what, whatever area you're around, you're not just there because you got a good deal on a home. Like you're a missionary. God has called you and he's purposed you specifically for that area. There's someone. And one of the places that, that I've been very convicted about over the years, when I transitioned from Costa Mesa uh, here to Las Vegas, um, we had some gatherings of some neighbors and things like that. But what I realized was there were a lot of people in my neighborhood after ha having lived there for 10 years that I didn't know. And I felt a real conviction that when I moved to a new city, that the people around me, because I wonder when my knee bows before my king, I wonder whether or not he will ask me mm. the names of the people that lived three doors down. And I, I think there will be a deep conviction of talking about them. Oh, yeah, there was that neighbor with the red, the red door, the loud dog or whatever, but not knowing their name. And I think that wherever God places you, he purposes you. He has a calling. And I think what you're saying is very true. Sometimes we think of a Las Vegas as the missions field because we see it as the Sodom and Gomorrah of whatever happens in Vegas stays in Las Vegas. But the reality is those things exist in yeah. our neighborhood yeah. Yeah. right where we live. Yeah. And that urgency needs to live in us. Wow. Incredible. You said, uh, whatever God places you, he purposes you. That strikes me. That That's going to be the tagline on the you know, as we promote the episode. That's so good, man. Um, what's coming to my mind? So, Mike, tell us a little bit about the Neon Museum where we went yesterday. Uh, just tell us about, you know, how did you, how did you find it? Because I want to make a parallel from the Neon Museum to the next question I have. But tell us a little bit about what that was. Well, the Neon Museum is a a place in the city that has it's they call it the boneyard it's a place where signs from the 40s and the 50s and the 60s that once were on the strip have uh outlived their purpose so to speak and so now they're in a, a place where people can go and and not only that but they have this really cool app that you can listen to sort of the the history of the sign and and this is where elvis got married and this is where you know so and so uh even even there's a place where you know the black artists of of the early uh, 50s they had to wait till 2:30 in the morning to to do their shows just because of the culture and the acceptance of of uh, race and and whatnot so it's it's a bit of a museum using the artifacts historical artifacts of this city 
Yeah. So these artifacts that are, you know, they're, they're the signpost of hotels, of casinos, of businesses throughout the eras of Las Vegas. But what, what I was trying to make a parallel is um, Las Vegas is known for their lights, for the, you know, it's almost like when, when you think of a moth, it's attracted to light. And uh, these lights are there for a reason. They're there with the purpose of getting your attention. So I was trying to make the parallel. These signs attract people to, to their desires, right? To their desires to be met. How is the church staying relevant in a day and age where there's lights and smokes? Uh, is that what the church needs to do? And I know, you know, I'm not just saying, uh, you know, the mega church and the experience that we all know, you know, kind of like lights and smoke. But tell me a little bit of, like, how does the church stay relevant in an era where you need, like, massive signs to attract people to these places? Right. No, that's a great, that's a great question. It, what's fascinating is I think we all would agree that people are drawn to the same thing. So you talk about the lights, the the, the attractive nature of it. But what are people looking for? People are looking to belong. They want to be a part of something. They, they want a sense that they're needed and wanted, that they're seen. Um, they, they, you know, so much of what Vegas is catering to is this longing of significance, right? It's why everyone's going to put everything on black or on red or take that risk. They, they, they want to walk away feeling and believing that they are the champion. And so Vegas has figured out how to capitalize on that need. But that need is something God placed in us that can only truly be fulfilled by God's movement and God's spirit and God's son. And so that need is what the church is really called to fill. At the core, people can, can spend all their time trying to get that need met through gambling or through you know some kind of night out with the girls or the guys. But here's what happens in the morning every single time. They wake up empty. They wake up still having that need and that longing. And the church, if the church is going to be the church, it's got to pay attention. People are walking around like zombies, needing, needing, longing, wanting someone to see them. And if we pay attention, there are people just waiting for someone to say, I see you, I love you, and why don't I walk with you? I can tell you, probably even though I've been a part of mega churches and I, all these kinds of attractional models which serve their purpose, but I'll tell you that the number one thing that I've seen that has served people is to see them just as individuals before we see them as a crowd and walk with them, get to know them, love on them, ask them, be interested in them. Just that one attention to detail will change someone's life because they are hoping someone will notice. And when we do, we actually become the church. Wow. Mic drop right there. Mike, what are you thinking of? Well, the church is people, right? The church is not brick more. Here's one that really struck me about Vegas. You know, as we were walking, it's, it's more fun at night with all the lights and stuff. But the, what really struck me was the, the people were very friendly. Like, I was amazed at how many individuals looked me in the eye, said hello. Um, that really surprised me. It wasn't like people were coming to, you know, with their head down and I'm going to go slink off and do something, you know, hanky. Um, there was just this community feel that that kind of caught me off guard and i don't think you know it was a women trying to pick me up or i mean i'm, I'm an ofar right but regardless it, it was just this and, and you use the word hanky. hanky so yeah that's that's <laughs> <laughs> so the but it, what it what it what it reinforces for me is exactly what you're saying is people are people yeah and everybody's you know the, what's the sweetest sounding word to a person's ear it's their name everybody wants to know their name and so even in a, in, a, in a community where people are going to, for pleasure, so to speak, there was a, still this longing for, for connection. And, uh, and I experienced that on the Strip. Yeah. There was a friendliness right. about the Strip that, that really uh, took me by surprise. That's right. Yeah. Patrick, what I was really looking forward for you to say is, as we were walking on Fremont Street in Las Vegas, I saw this, this place that said, uh, take a picture with a Chippendale. 
And I was hoping you would say, man, that's how we're st trying to stay relevant. You can take a picture with the pastor, like showing your your guns and some. You're not doing anything like that. No, I, I do that. <laughs> I do that every Friday night. So that's a, that's a, I have a whole show. Uh, it's got it's called Dancing with the Pastor, and uh, I've got a whole like Elvis outfit. It, it's another. It's we don't have time for that did show. You but it's, but did it's you learn your moves from Pastor Tim? So well, uh, listen. I, who do you think taught Pastor Tim? I mean, <laughs> before me, he just kind of stood there. But with me, I gave him a little swag. Nice. Are you marrying <laughs> marrying people like? Wedding chapel type of stuff. Or? I, I am. I am. I. I mean, I've been. I've been doing ministry for a long time. So I think one of the you most unique places that I've done a wedding is uh, there's a, a chapel um, in a miniature golf area that is the theme is Kiss. So if you remember the oh, band yeah. Kiss. So that the whole theme is Kiss, and there's a chapel uh, that has all the figurines of Kiss, uh, and so that's probably the most unique chapel that I've ever done a wedding. Well, that's awesome, yeah. So as I think of the fun elements of the city, you know, Mike was mentioning like you really go to this Fremont Street and just even the strip. You know, there's lights and people are out, and it, it does have like a party feel. Um, how do you have fun in Vegas and kind of like staying clean? Like you were saying, you know, like these are my non-negotiables, but this is how I, I still get to have fun. Yeah. The, the cool thing about Vegas is it really is very beautiful. People don't realize that uh, Mount Charleston, the, literally you can experience snow in the desert uh, within 45 minutes. And so wow. my family and I, we, we, went, we went snowboarding uh, about a month ago. And so you've got that and then you've got some incredible beautiful landscape especially if you like hiking you like being in the outdoors red rock so you've got some of these things that are just natural beauties that are just a lot of fun and so people can enjoy that without having to head, head up the strip and just kind of enjoy the the beauty of the desert love it mike do you have any more questions well couple questions. One was, you know, you and I both are police chaplains, right? Yep. And when we were driving down the strip, the guys were talking about, oh, this is where the, this is where the shooting was taking place and stuff. And have you found, what's been your, um, you know, the last year or so, our cops are just taking a beating, yeah. right? And, and, but how has your role as a chaplain, um, and how specifically, how is that tragedy on the strip, uh, have you seen, uh, a ripple effect in the department. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, so October 1 was historically uh, one of the most significant uh, mass shootings in our history. And that one moment, because Vegas is, is very much transitory. Very few people are from Vegas. And so they're, they're transplants from all over uh, the country, all over the world. And so one of the unique things for Vegas is that it hasn't completely had an identity um, because there's so many individuals. There, we didn't necessarily even have a, a, a hometown sports team. But October 1 did something that has never been done or there hasn't been any other event that's been catalytic. And what it did was it solidified our city. There was kind of a mantra that said, whatever happens to one of us happens to all of us. And there was this overwhelming sense of unity, this, this, this partnership, this family dynamic that we had never seen before. And, and even though now it's been many years since that mass shooting, I, I would say that that's continued since then. Since then, we, uh, our, our Golden Knights hockey team uh, became this incredible uh, national hockey team, and we've rallied around that. We now have these teams that we can kind of wrap our arms around. But I would also say that the the law enforcement community and what's happened to really that community nationally has been probably one of the one of the most discouraging um, elements. It, it, it's 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 the, there is a lose lose. Uh, in the law enforcement community because they're stepping in, they're protecting, they're serving, and yet there's such a fear. Even the guys, you and I have talked about it, the, the guys that are in the trenches, the, the lieutenants, the sergeants, the captains, the chiefs, like every day they're putting their life on the line, but the level of respect, the level of admiration, all of that is minimal, if not gone, 
and they're now walking on eggshells wondering whether or not they're going to be sued, they're going to be viewed negatively. It's just, and every statistic has tripled in the law enforcement community. Uh, addiction, depression, anxiety, um, you know, you, divorce, all of those because the amount of pressure and stress that is taking place. And for a lot of guys, they're tapping out. They're, they're retiring. They're saying, I, I can't be in this. So we're losing more and more incredible officers uh, that no longer want to be on the field. So it's just uh, my prayer is that that would shift and we would identify. I mean, yes, there's always officers that, that need to leave and, and that shouldn't be a part of the law enforcement. But I tell you, in, in the work that I've been able to do, there are heroes that are doing the work of the ministry. They're serving, protecting, loving, and they're the first ones to run into a building. And I hope we transition into a place of honor for them because of the work that they do. Wow, that's incredible. And um, well, I knew Pastor Mike, like you've been a chaplain in Costa Mesa for so many years. You started like 25 years ago or so, right? And uh, I've always admired that part of you as a leader and as a pastor. I'm like, you're really committed to loving the city by loving, like being a chaplain and loving the people that care for the city, like practically care for the city and this is uh kind of like an eye-opening conversation for me because I'm, I'm i mean i don't have any relationship with with law enforcement or anything so i'm kind of curious to know uh, i mean the easy question for me is always like how did we get here but as you talk about the hope of things transitioning for a better future is there any like where do you guys see hope f in, in this you no? Know, cop situation maybe for Amer maybe even for the world right but let's just let's just talk about your guys's relationships with cops um where do you see hope for the future of even the, just broad the future of policing you want to tackle that one uh, i'll just say this I, i'm encouraged by the the the, the new waves of officers that are coming into the academy. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a new group of, of young people. We got 20-somethings that are stepping in, and they, they've grown up in kind of what's, what they've seen on television, politically, even this, the, the temperature that exists. Um, they're aware of it. And I'm, I'm encouraged because they're, they're coming in, I would probably define it as sober-minded, a, a lot of the discouragement with officers are those that have been around for 10, 15, 20 years, and they, uh, they, they knew what it used to be like. Mm -hmm. And so that disparity of what it was once and what it is now, that's the place of just disappointment because it's, it's shifted. These new guys that are coming in, they actually don't know any different. They, they, they're living in this current reality. And in a lot of ways, that will give them new perspective. Um, they don't have this, this, you know, kind of factor of the past. They only know what they know. And to be honest with you, sometimes that can be an encouragement because they walk in with kind of fresh eyes and excitement and a desire for things to be different. So I'm encouraged by the new wave of officers. I'm encouraged by their wisdom, their humility, um, their courage to step into this culture. Um, so I see these young guys and I see hope. And I think that uh, the more officers that we get that are stepping in, uh, I think that the more hopeful our future is going to be. Yeah, and I, I just would say from a broader umbrella perspective, crisis does different things to different people. I would imagine that there are probably men and women on the Las Vegas police force right now who are wearing the badge because in part because of this massacre that happened it motivated them in the same way that maybe 9-11 you know motivated people to go into the military or whatever and so if you're I, I would just say again to as a pastor to those of you listening if you're in a bit of a crisis right now um, it doesn't have to be uh, the thing that overwhelms you it might actually be the window through which God wants to say hey there's a place for you your voice needs to be you know spoken here this is really your ministry and your call and so um, crisis 
you know, it's that was a defining moment, right? That October event, yep. Um, yep. and and but it might have been the very thing that launched these men and women to say, you know what, I I want to I want to serve not just any city, but I want to serve Vegas because this is my city. That's right. Wow, that's incredible. So, in one of my latest episodes, I was talking to an activist in Chicago, and somewhere in the middle of the of the conversation. You guys can go check it out, and it was a good talk. Uh, but she she said this, and I'm I'm gonna say this because I think it reflects a bigger sentiment, not just her opinion, but uh, it's not the first time I hear this. But she said something along the lines of, you know, white people should shut up for like the next hundred years or so, you know. And she's an activist. She works with communities that uh, she says have been marginalized. And as she was describing her community, I was relating that to my community in Costa Mesa and I was like, wow, this, what you're describing sounds a lot like mine. And I would you know as we witnessed here in Las Vegas and we kind of drove around a little bit, I'm like, well, this happens everywhere, right? There, the uh, disparity, marginalization, like all this stuff. So the question is, I mean, one is, what is that stir in your mind? Like the, the unfairness or injustice, do those words, what do those words mean to you? Well, I, I think they're huge, especially with the gospel. You know, those of us that are Christ followers, we have to continue uh, to be a light on top of a hill. And we've got to be mindful of those that have felt like they have been in the shadows uh, for too long. And so we do, we do carry an, uh, an opportunity to be able to highlight, to esteem, to honor, to lift up, to support those And really, so many uh, ethnicities, so many cultures have been marginalized. It's, it's not just uh, African Americans or Hispanics or Asian Americans. They're, we as a culture have very much kind of lived in, a, in, a, in an entitled posture. And we like what we like and we want what we want. And we don't, we're not mindful to look around and to see who are those that don't have. Who are the, those that have been forgotten or dismissed because of color of skin or language or background or sexual orientation or whatever? Whatever the variable is that makes someone feel like they're unwanted and not needed and forgotten. And so I do believe we have a responsibility to pay attention. Um, I think even that comment of, you know, white people need to shut up. I, I understand the, the framework of that because I think basically my impression would be from that statement is we've got to be willing to kind of step down, you know, those uh, different uh, uh, cultures of maybe power and recognize and give opportunity for others to step up and to raise others up and, and maybe to minimize our voices or whatever the dominant culture is so that we can maximize and highlight other voices. And so I think that's a good conversation and we need to have it because we, we don't do well with it. And oftentimes we don't even engage in it. So I think, I think it's a great thing to talk about. Wow. Mike, you, <laughs> I said, we're going to do this in another episode. But you kind of have, in a sense, I mean, and I'm, I'm almost tear up right here, but you have given me a voice. And like I said at the beginning, you know, I'm, I'm an undocumented person in the United States. And you, you kind of like, not, not like embrace me or welcome me, but you saw my potential. And uh, can you speak to that a little bit? Because I, I feel like... <laughs> It's almost like you're, you're doing, like this woman is saying, you know, let's shut up for the next hundred years. And that's in a sense what you did. I'm like, I'm giving a voice to Beto. I'm, you know, I'm helping him think of his uh, goals, maybe his capacity, his abilities, uh, the Christian podcast, right? Like you, you've been supportive in that sense. So can you speak a little bit to that? Well, yeah. I mean, first I'd say that's a, that is a whole new, epi a different episode. Um, Isn't that what Jesus does for us? You know, he, mm -hmm. he, he doesn't look so much as who, we, who we've been 
as much as where we're going and how he leads us. And, and that's the gospel. That's the, that's the beauty of the gospel. And even this last week, I spoke about the, the woman caught in adultery. And Jesus said, you know, go and sin no more. And, and I think you got to move to improve, right? You got to keep moving. And so I think with you, it's, it, we're all immigrants. Like my, my grandparents were from Russia and Germany. And so I'm a, I'm a son of an in, immigrant. And we, when, when we lose, I think if we, that's the beauty of America. It's the great melting pot. And if we lose uh, our perspective that everybody has a unique signature, everybody has a unique contribution, and my calling in, in life is to help raise up other people's uh, contribution. And so when I, when I respond to my response to this, 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 this woman in Chicago, this activist, I think we just can do a better job of listening. And, and, you know, even for us, when we moved into a, a uh, when we were invited as an Anglo church to share a, a church space with a Spanish speaking congregation, I just learned you got to listen. You got to spend more time listening and less time talking. And when you listen to people, you find out that they actually have a pretty interesting story. Hmm. And, and I've just personally, I've found it's a whole lot more fun for me to raise other people up and to applaud them and cheer them and to, to see them flourish like yourself um, than to, to, to do it myself. So that's, that's right. an easy, a simple answer to a complex question. Amen. Yeah. Okay. So this is how we're going to wrap up the episode. Uh-oh. Yeah. We're going to go from blasphemous to divine. Now we have two people here, so maybe we can share the ideas and yeah, let's do that. No. So either one of you will go one by one. So I have five emojis I said at the beginning. It's blasphemous, skeptical, inspired, holy, and divine. So their emoji reactions, I have one here in my hat. This is the blasphemous one. So the idea is, as you think of, maybe you guys are pastors and you guys are chaplains in different cities, but nonetheless, no relatable experience. So in the type of work that you guys do, what would you say is the most blasphemous idea that you've heard or you've experienced? Well, let's start with Patrick. And then if you want to add on, uh, Mike, we'll go or we go to the next emoji. <laughs> the most blas blasphemous idea. I'm not sure I, I would know context. So are we talking about like ministry related? Like what? What event have I seen or been a part of? Yes. So let's stick to the, the title of today is The Sins of Sin City. Yeah. So as it relates to that, what would be the most blasphemous idea? Well, I, I think one of the ideas was us preaching the gospel um, at, at uh, strip bars. So that's been something that not many... Were you wearing clothes when you were preaching? Let, let don't, we don't need to ask follow-up questions on this. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say there were dollar bills. About, no, I'm just, So I, I would probably say that that's something... Because you, you think about Jesus' ministry. Yeah. He went, right? He went to those. He came to seek and to save what was lost. Yeah. And, uh, and so there's a lot of lostness here in Las Vegas. And so we've intentionally looked at opportunities of where people were. And instead of asking them to come to us, we went to them. Mm. And so we have been on the streets and we have been around the prostitutes and we have been in, you know, at the, at the, at the strip clubs, um, being able to minister and to provide resources and to serve those that are there. So that, that I think may fall in that category. Okay. We'll take it. That's blasphemous right there. So let's move on to skeptical. It's either an skeptical idea or what are you skeptical of when it comes to ministry or the sins of sin city? Skeptical. Um, I, I would say I would be skeptical if churches as a whole are able to really understand how to reach lost people. I think I'm, I'm discovering that oftentimes people keep doing the same thing, expecting different results, and it doesn't work. Yeah. And so we have to start thinking differently, but I'm not convinced that churches want to do that mm. you want to add to that mike or no amen 
Amen. Let's move on to the next one. Inspired. Either what inspires you or where do you see inspiration as it relates to Las Vegas and the sins of Sin City? Well, you know, by the way, you know the difference between people who pray in church and people who pray in casinos, right? What? People in casinos really mean it. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. <laughs> so, my, Mike has been waiting all day for that one. Just That's so you blasphemous know, so. right there. That's blasphemous. <laughs> okay, inspiration. I, I've been really inspired uh, by these young leaders, to be honest with you. I, I'm seeing a lot of these 20-somethings that have been living in this culture, and they're not leaving. They're actually saying, this is my city, and... I'm going to do my best to serve this city. And I, honestly, I think that's the future. If these young guys can get rooted well in Christ and they can stay committed to their city, they're the future. And so I'm encouraged to see a lot of these young guys that are doing that. And they understand the culture. They've lived in the culture. But at the same time, they're, they're not living for the culture. And they're, they're genuinely living for Jesus. Love it. Okay, so next one is... One to the last, holy. Where do you see something holy or holiness um, in Las Vegas? Where do I see holiness uh, in Las Vegas? Goodness. Um, I, you know, the, the, the first thing that comes to my mind um, is marriages. Mm. The, so the, you see these little chapels all over the strip. And people come and they can get these quickie marriages. and But I'm seeing a lot of marriages be rescued and restored. And so, I, the, you know, the, the marriage as a whole is either... You, the purpose of marriage is either someone believes it's to make you happy or to make you holy. And what mm. I'm beginning to see is people are understanding, those that I've been able to walk with, that marriage isn't about just happiness it's about christ-centeredness and holiness that god's producing in their life so that's that's the when you first said that that was the first thing that popped in my mind love it love it that's that's why they're called emoji reactions mike do you want to add to anything no okay so the last one is divine where do you see divinity or divine in the sense of sin city in las vegas <laughs> Divinity. Oh, man. I, you, did, define that one for me. That one I'm probably going to need a little bit more context. Okay, I'll define it. It's. Uh, I should have shown you pictures of the emojis, but it, it has a crown and he got like teary eyes of happiness and joy. So it's like what produces like the highest sentiment of all of maybe even laughter of i would i would stick with joy like where no let's just say divinity is joy where did you see joy in las vegas well the, i'll tell you as you're taught i don't know if this is with the framework of it but um ch churches have a unique way of making reaching lost people about their individual mission But what I've enjoyed, where I see joy, where I, I is the sense of unity. Mm. I, I'm seeing more churches come together and pursue the mission and vision together than independent mission and visions. And so with a church that's a million plus and the needs of the city, as Costa Mesa has, and see, seeing the disparity and, and the homelessness and the addiction and all these things, It's been wonderful to watch. There's been, I, I, you know, when you said joy, I thought, what was the last thing that really brought me joy? And it was to, to see these churches coming together for a common cause. And that's been, that's been pretty beautiful to watch. Wow, that's amazing. Mike, do you want to add anything to that? Well, I would just say, what, what, tell us your church, name of your church, so people who are coming to Vegas yeah. for vacation, for fun, and they want to get a bit of a spiritual reset in their own life, where, where can they find you? Yeah, so our church is called Hope Church, and it's here in Las Vegas. So if you Googled it, uh, you know, Hope Church in Las Vegas, you'd find it over by St. Rose Parkway on uh, Cactus. Uh, and we'd love to have you. So we've got services uh, Thursday night at 6.30. 
as well as on Sunday at 8.30 and 10.30 in the morning. Love it. Mike, what about your church in Costa Mesa? <laughs> well, we're in Palm, Palm Harvest Church on the west side of, of town. You can find our uh, all about us at hellopastormike.com. A cool app there that's got lots of features and videos. And, and this podcast will probably be, uh, you could find it there as well. I encourage you to check it out. And if you're uh, looking for a, a family, a church family, whether you're here in Vegas or Orange County or elsewhere, we invite you to, to join us uh, digitally if, if that's what works for you. Um, because really the church is not a building. It's not even a location. It's people. And you're the church. So be the church today. You know, as you step into dark places, as you step into um, places that need some joy, be the joy. Right. And with Jesus' help, God's help, uh, you can. Amen.